he's had a lot of different uh, roles and uh, uh, in Indianapolis it was real estate, right Andy, that's what, that was your game. And now he's back in, the, in, that, uh, in that role and uh, doing a tremendous job for, for Keller Williams uh, that he's going to talk about here. But, uh, I, I, think, um, I think all of us in the room, and there's a lot of folks in the, in the mortgage business and the banks, and all that, I think the fact that uh, if you look around, Trent and, and EG and Ed Luna and a lot of the other folks that are involved, uh, I, I think we're making some great inroads, right? Uh, some leadership positions, being able to talk about the market and getting our, getting our salespeople. So without further ado, Andy, CEO, team leader, with Ken Williams here in St. Paul. Andy Noble. Thank you all for uh, coming here today. This this is kind of a this is kind of a special opportunity for me, and and kind of a culmination of my relationship with Rick. Uh, so as he said, 13 years ago, I came to the Twin Cities. Uh, was going through a lot of. Uh, different changes in my life uh, professionally and personally and um, and uh, I'd spent 31 years as of today in, in real estate so I've been around this industry for a while 0708 if any of us remember was a pretty tough time economically it was certainly tough for the real estate industry I was pretty invested in it had a Cobalt Banker franchise was in a part in the multifamily industry pretty heavy and uh, took some some pretty sustained losses coming out of 0708 uh, down in Indianapolis and so over a two-year period was really unwinding out of a lot of things that I had been invested in for 25 years and uh, so when I moved up here just not to bore you with all the details uh, I came here in 08 and I did what everybody does your first year you move somewhere you run for political office right <laughs> so uh, and and I'll, I'll be honest the only reason I, I take time to share this is you know, for those of you that know Rick Aguilar, I mean, Rick is uh, is a real community leader and, a, and just a, a true friend on a personal level to me. But uh, Rick is the reason I honestly had opened my eyes to multicultural. I mean, I, I'm not just saying that for the purpose of his conference. When I ran for Ramsey County Commissioner, which was the West Sides, uh, Highland Park, and downtown St. Paul, I met this guy and he's like, you know, hey, I'm doing these conferences, you know, I'm obviously from the, uh, from the Latino community and, you know, just really opened my eyes to a lot of things, with, especially with his leadership and roles that he's been in. I mean, this guy's been on the Met Council. He was the past president of the St. Paul Chamber. So somebody I really looked up to, and as I started to come to his conferences every year, I started to realize the opportunity in multicultural just in terms of running for political office. And I thought that, man, I, if I'm going to get to know people, I need to really get to know these, these extremely diverse communities. And so I did that when I ran. And even though I didn't win, I did pretty well, actually, in the race for a guy from Indiana uh, for, for less than a year on the ground running for, you know, and a lot of people wondered, who is this guy? Like, how, how's he getting the numbers out of the, out of the, uh, out of the precincts that, that, uh, that we got in 2000, and 2000? This was in 2010 I ran. And uh, I'm going to tell you, it was multicultural. I mean, we held a we held a town hall here at Neighborhood House, with uh, you know there was a lot of Hispanics that, that came to that from this community, and were very interested in learning about some new ideas and different things. As as Rafael was in the you know he's been in that position at that point for 16 years, four terms. And again, I'm not here to talk about <laughs> politics, but I just I think the whole story comes to the essence of how powerful it is for us to understand the importance and the opportunities that come out of multicultural communities. And this is a, such a diverse city. I mean, I love it for, you know, I used to travel a lot internationally and I think that's one of the coolest things about Minneapolis, St. Paul is we have to not only celebrate the diversity, but see the opportunity. And that's what, that's what I'm talking about more and more with people is everybody shoving politics and, and the, the requirements of, of accepting diversity down everybody's throat, but they're not really looking at the opportunity. And, and if, we can, if we can obviously get more people involved in the opportunity, we'll solve the inclusion and the diversity issue, right? So we, at Keller Williams, what we did was, 
we, uh, when I, I took this position four years ago, and about two years into it, I started, you know, kind of drawn from my experience in running for political office. And I said, well, gosh, we got this diverse group of, of uh, there's over a hundred multicultural communities for represented here from around the world. You, you don't have that in a lot of American cities other than tier one cities like Chicago, New York, LA, Houston. Uh, we have that kind of diversity here. We just don't have the same numbers as these tier one cities. And so I started thinking, God, what, what, are we missing something here as far as an opportunity since I recruit agents to Keller Williams? You know, when, when we recruit multicultural agents, we're recruiting business, right? So our agents are our customers, you know? E.J. and Isaac, who you're going to hear about, are very successful realtors in our, in our office and in this industry, and they're also leaders. But when we recruit them or are able to recruit them to our office, we're recruiting market, what we call market share, which is people that are buying and selling homes because they have many relationships in those communities. They understand those cultures. So why don't we go after this market and really start to forge those relationships with these different communities. And so I literally started this, and I honestly think we have started something here in the Twin Cities that's starting to be impacted by other brokerages because this was not being done two years ago, I can tell you, by any of the companies. And, and Gijay can speak to that because she used to be with Coldwell Banker. Um, and, and so I've never seen it in 31 years. I've never seen anybody actually create something to target multicultural. So we created this thing with the logo down in the bottom uh, corner here called the MAC, or short, we refer to it as the MAC, which is the Multicultural Agents Council. And it's basically just an internal organization that had three missions <coughs> within our office that we wanted to uh, create for agents. And one, the first thing was, how do we educate our agents about these various communities because you don't have to be from a particular community to do business with that community. I think we all agree most people don't, you know, we work with all types of folks from different communities, but we don't necessarily take the time to understand their cultures, the way they like to do business and build relationships or, or anything about them. So what if we could teach them in those hundred different communities about their cultures, their communities, their language in a very limited level? Um, and so that was kind of the mission, one of the core missions of the Multicultural Agents Council was to create kind of a dossier of information, about 25 to 30 page Word document for each community, but we created the template and then went and found the data. And so I hired an intern that helped me put a lot of that information together to start on the top 30 size communities here in the Twin Cities. Um, and so we have that information for agents if they want to know it. And we get into things like, you know, what is, uh, uh, we, you know, things culturally about those communities, things about their language, you know, basic greetings. We get into things like where do these folks from these different communities like to shop? Where do they like to eat? Where do they live? And not in terms of cities, but in terms of neighborhoods or in terms of apartment complexes or whatever. So we, this is what we created with the, uh, with the kind of community profiles. And then we also got into doing scholarships for people from various communities that might want to get a, a license to sell real estate. A lot of people right now want to sell real estate. We have a lot of career transition folks wanting to get in this industry. Why? It's a very good living. I mean, if you can be successful at it. And we also were an essential business during COVID. So if you really check, the real estate economy has probably been one of the core drivers through COVID of the national economy. Think how many industries are affected by our industry. As Rick said, mortgage, banking, uh, construction, you know, all these different things that are impacted by, by our real estate industry. So that being said, uh, that, that was the second uh, tier was the community profiles. And then um, we, we did scholarships or are offering scholarships through partnerships with the several real estate schools. And then really the last thing um, that, uh, uh, well, actually I, I wanna switch, let's, let's bring up that first slide if we can. Yeah, I, want to, I just want to highlight some of this information real quick for you guys about uh, kind of some very interesting demographics. Uh, this is real stuff that is, I mean, when you start to look at this, you realize how impacting multicultural is on our local and national economy and how these numbers are going to be uh, creating quite an impact in the years to come. You know, by 2030, one out of four people will either be Hispanic or Asian. Now, I noticed in some of these slides, you know, you see the reference to Hispanics and Asians. African-Americans are about 14% of the population. 
you also have to figure out how you're analyzing large groups of people all the way down to actual co different cultures, right? We have a lot of African uh, communities here in the Twin Cities that are represented, you know, different uh, African nations that have populations here. So the question is, are you counting that as part of the African American population? Obviously you wouldn't. These are, these are more immigrants from African countries. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of impact. We'll go to the next slide, Rico, if you would. Um, the buying power of Hispanics and Asians, this was really interesting to me. I mean, this is really going to be a significant community and already is for home buyers. And we're seeing it in our, in our uh, brokerage. We're seeing a lot of growth with Hispanic, uh, Asian, and African American communities for, that are looking to be home buyers, either for the first time or, or also taking advantage of the market right now and the equity that they've been able to build up uh, within their. Um, within their different communities. So go to the next, yep. Over 60% of all first time home buyers in America today are minorities. This, this really jumped out at me. Our trade organization, the National Association of Realtors has said to our members and they're not paying attention. And we have 1.3, 1.4 million members in the United States that are realtors. Oh, that's how many realtors there are in the US. We have about 23,000 here in Minnesota. Six out of 10 home buyers in the next 10 years will come from communities of color. You think that might be something realtors and real estate companies ought to be paying attention to? And yet they're not. They're not. I'm telling you, they have not been paying attention to this. So you've got opportunities with getting people into this business from these communities like Guy J and like uh, Isaac, which has been, you know, tr just tremendous. I mean, th these guys have done very well in their, in their respective industry but you've also got the opportunity for people for home ownership. And that's really a big deal for a lot of people in this country. <clears throat> so rapid growth of our multicultural population, 38% of the population has a multicultural background that works out to 120 million people, 40 million of them are foreign born. And Minnesota is a big, this is a big market for foreign born immigrants. And we have refugee communities I mean, why are we not celebrating the opportunities that can come out of this instead of talking about the politics of this and why we have to do this? this is, it's, it's crazy, crazy. So uh, next, next screen, strong buying power, multicultural, uh, has increased from 661 billion in 90 to 3.4 trillion in 2014. Now, some of these numbers are a little dated and we're gonna update them. Uh, and that's part of what the, that's the third piece of what the MAC is doing is actually we're looking to partner with a, a local college or university to actually update housing study information. So uh, you, you're, who's our friend over at, uh, uh, you know the guy, uh, Indian gentleman that, uh, yeah, Dr. Bruce Corey. Another guy that inspired me to do this, uh, and he certainly didn't ask me to do this, but he, he is the only guy I've been able to find who's done a housing study of none of, I'm sure nobody here knows about. Uh, and he had it done in 2013 of the uh, impact that multicultural communities are having on the housing market here locally, both in terms of home ownership and rental. And I was so compelled by this when I saw this. Um, he determined in 2013, eight years ago, that the home buying market, the home ownership market here in the Twin Cities in terms of aggregate home value was about $20 billion. If you took the entire base of, you know, and he's the only guy that studied this. He got grants from Wilder Foundation and a couple other groups to look at this. And it was determined that it was the home ownership market was about $20 billion estimated in terms of these roughly 100 multicultural communities. And what's interesting about that is only 40% of the communities are homeowners. So $20 billion. So I immediately started thinking to myself, well, what if we had 100% homeownership, which we would never achieve, right? But what if it was 100%? That would be $50 billion impact on our economy here locally. You think that might be something government and industry ought to be paying attention to, right? So. That was just the homeownership side. Then he looked at the rental side and they, he determined that there was about a $350, $360 million a year impact on rental housing payments that were being made in aggregate by these communities to the local you know, landlords, whatever you want to call them, rental, rental uh, owners. That's a big number, right? That's a, that's a lot of money changing hands in terms of rental housing payments. So, you know, 
we in the real estate industry clearly have not been paying attention to this or finding studies like this, the few that have been done, and really realizing this is a big, big, big market, and we have to do that. So we're doing it at our office. This is not a Keller Williams wide initiative. We started this, the Multicultural Agents Council, in our office. Yeah, so uh, just to some other numbers again, these are just through 2015. I mean, look, look at the impact. And the evict Minnesota, or is this a the, These numbers are national. national. Yeah, yeah, at this point. And again, these are, these are based on 2015 numbers, so we're going to be updating these numbers. Um, but that's what we're looking for, a local university partner uh, to do these housing study updates you know, that Dr. Corey started, because this is an ever-changing, these numbers are ever-changing and these, these markets are ever-changing, so we need to know what these numbers are. And we're not in a position as a Keller Williams office to be able to, to do that work. So we think a university partner would be a great partner to, uh, to have do that. So uh, just, you know, cor according to the Harvard Joint Center for Housing, it is estimated between 2015 and 2025, nearly 12 and a half million households uh, will add nearly 12 and a half million households total. If trends hold, that means three and a half million new immigrant households. I don't know if you guys realize this, but this thing called COVID that's been really devastating on our economy, and then go back to even 07, 08, and we had a really rough downturn in the real estate economy and the economy in general, uh, some of which some people are worried where we're heading right now economically, but, but that's a different story. I immigrants and uh, these multicultural communities are largely the reason for pulling us out of those with spending on homes, consumer goods. This is, this is a big part of our economy in the United States today. And so when we come out of these recoveries, even out of, out of COVID, immigrant communities are, are largely the reason why we're doing that with, with spending and with home ownership uh, uh, increasing in these communities. So go ahead and switch that, Rico, if you would, please. Thank you. Immigrants have also been crucial to the housing market's recovery after the 08 downturn, even more telling, a 2014 study by the Bipartisan Policy Commission, a D.C. Uh, think tank, concluded that if current birth rates trends continue, immigrants and their children will be the source of almost all U.S. population growth and, by extension, the primary driver of demand for new residential construction. I mean, that's pretty profound, isn't it? So... Anyway, uh, immigrants do have a significantly low rate of home ownership, 50.5% compared to 65.9. Locally, it was it's about four, it was about 40%. I don't know that number may have. I would not be surprised that number has gone up a little bit since he did that housing study. But that's uh, that's that's there's tons of opportunity in this in in terms of the real estate industry. Anyway, in kind of wrapping up here, I just wanted to highlight uh, the two, two other slides. These are some of the organizations that have developed within our industry. Um, and you're going to hear from Isaac, who's the president of one of them, and, and DJ was the past president of that organization. So we're very uh, supportive sponsors and members of these organizations here locally. I, I will say, um, also, when we talk about multicultural, we include some additional communities, so it's not just ethnic or race-based uh, communities. We can include the LGBTQ community. Yes, sir. <laughs> For, well, from NAREB? I thought we are a member. We are a member, you guys. Or we, we certainly were. Uh, okay, well, there you go. No, no, I, I know we, uh, we are, a support, we are uh, supportive of NAREB. Yeah, and I know you're involved in NAREB. Uh, I don't want to get in trouble here, you know. Uh, no, N NAREB is, and you could speak to that organization, that's a long-standing organization here locally and nationally that uh, is um, working a lot with the African-American community and, and has done a lot of good stuff with respect to housing here in the Twin Cities, which has had some interesting uh, history and background uh, within that community. Uh, Nagel Rep is uh, the National Association of Gay and Lesbian Real Estate Professionals. We're a member of that, and now the Real Estate Alliance has started out of that. Uh, again, you know, these are, I mean, they're, they're communities, professional organizations within these communities that have um, members. And uh, I mean, a lot of people, when they go to buy or sell a home, they want to find somebody from these organizations that's a member. You know, they're looking for somebody from that community or who can, you know, who understands their culture or their language or what have you. So 
Um, these are all very active organizations on a national level. I just want to share this next screen and then I'll conclude. Uh, this is, uh, this, I put together this. This took me quite a while to do this, but I had to go on, on, on the internet and look up a lot of this stuff. This is not readily available, and these are numbers here in the Twin Cities, in, in, uh, here in Minnesota in the Twin Cities. So I was trying to figure out, okay, of these 100 communities, who, what, who, what are we talking about? And, I mean, even the state demographer doesn't have it this detailed. So, you know, I, I literally was looking. These are all representative communities here in the Twin Cities. Some of them obviously very small, some of them very large, right? And, of course, when we talk about the Hispanic community or the African-American community, again, these are broader contexts for, um, for uh, talking about multicultural communities because there could be many different cultural communities or ethnic communities that can make up that broader context discussion like Hispanic, right? We, we don't, that, that doesn't represent a country per se. It's, it's a collective of countries. <laughs> yeah, this, this information is based on, on uh, actually... I don't know if it references at the top. These might have been 2015 or 17 estimates at the time. So, yeah, this data is always ever-changing. The, the problem with census data, and this is why I went a little deeper, is um, census data doesn't necessarily represent the entirety of those communities and people here. So there's a lot of information if you want to do a deep dive that has maybe a little better estimates on how many people are here in the Twin Cities. I think if you take the Hmong community, I, I want to say the, the U.S. Census data showed at the time less than 100,000, but you know there's, there's believed to be more than that here in the Twin Cities. So you know, it's, it's not a, these are not exact numbers by any means, but I, I feel pretty comfortable with the numbers at the time that we did this. These were pretty finite numbers that were coming from a lot of different sources beyond just one, so yeah. I know, I don't have a number for Zimbabweans. Zimbabweans. Yes? So in your research, what was the total immigrant population or international population of the Twin Cities? Uh, I think on here, we, well, so we had about three, uh, three and a half million at the time this was done, which I want to say might be 2017 numbers. That's total population, right, in the Metro Twin Cities. And then, and of course, that's based on whether you're looking at the seven or 11 county or 13 county area, which I didn't look at the 13 county, which takes into account Western Wisconsin, but just the 11 county area of the Twin Cities. Um, again, figure about 40% of that number would represent the uh, multicultural. To that, Andy, and one of my friends has done a lot of research into this. There's roughly one million internationals in the Twin Cities. And the international is first or second generation. So out of that 3.5 million that you talk about, it's one in three, one in four in the Twin Cities, Twin Cities metro area is of an immigrant uh, first or second generation. Yep. So it is very significant that we, what that population is in the Twin Cities. Yep, Good, great point. I would say that's about right, one out of three, one out of four. Yeah. So anyway, uh, if anybody has any questions, I'll be around, but I uh, wanted to make sure we kind of covered some information as kind of a precursor to uh, Isaac and, and Gijay. So I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks, Andy.